Um, I'm going to start. So as I said, my name is Ophelia Dan. I'm the president of SSI at Columbia University. I've been involved with SSI. This is the third year since I started college. Um, just before we start, a quick note. Um, this um, presentation is being recorded by Students Supporting Israel. So in the Q&A, if you don't want to be recorded, that's fine. At some point, uh, we will stop the recording and if you want to ask question um, off the record you can just wait and ask it after we are done recording um, so before we start i just want to um, do a quick disclaimer as you are all aware or not student supporting israel is not a political and not a partisan movement uh, which means that i will try my best to stick to facts um, at the same time, after saying that, these are my personal experiences, so some of these things may sound to you as um, voicing a political opinion of, of any kind. Um, these are my opinions, not SSI's opinions. There are a variety of individuals within SSI who hold different opinions, so just keep that in mind throughout the presentation. Um, and a quick note, um, this was actually done before the previous presentation. So a member of Students for Justice in Palestine at Columbia was trying to bully um, us, SSI, um, uh, to not hold this event, to kind of shame us. So just like want to say on a general note, um, this is not shaming. Um, I think she should be ashamed for trying to stop dialogue and trying to stop you from people from talking about their personal opinions. Um, so just putting it out there and we at SSI would always keep speaking up, uh, even if people don't really like hearing that. Um, and on that positive note, let's start our presentation. Um, so I'm gonna give a little context um, to what is this area that everyone's been speaking about. Um, to an outside observer, it might seem like this area is the, you know, the area of the entire United States or China or, or Russia, but that's actually not the case. Um, it's only um, the territory that you see here behind that green line. The green line um, we'll speak about in a, in a, in a few seconds. So. A common misconception about Judea and Samaria um, is that before 1948, Jews never lived in those areas. Um, this is not true. These areas, um, unlike other areas in Israel or in other places, um, were always the cradle of Jewish civilizations. Um, the um, mothers and fathers of Judaism are buried in, in the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron, um, which is, if you look, well, for those of you who read Hebrew, it's uh, right here at the bottom. I don't know if you see my clicker, but if you do, um, it's right here. Uh, the Jewish temple, both of them uh, stood on um, what we now call the Temple Mountain, um, then called Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, which is right here in this little enclave. Um, so basically the entire story of judaism and how it evolved and how jews became a people transpired in this area the green line the little dotted line that you see here marking this territory was never an international border and it's relatively new um it only was marked for the first time in 1948 after what israel is calling the world of independence and the arab nations would call the 1948 war or the nakba um and this line was supposed to be the arms disagreement between Israel and Jordan. That would it was never supposed to mark any international border, um, because Jordan, although it controlled Judea and Samaria from 1948 um, to 1967, it never really wanted to. So uh, therefore, in 1988, it renounced all claims and said they don't want anything to do with this area um, and the inhabitants living in it. So you probably heard me say a few um, terms, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, the Occupied Territories. I'm pretty sure you heard these terms in different contexts. So just to, um, so you understand the difference between them and who you might encounter using each of these terms. The term I usually use, um, well, the term I always use is Judea and Samaria. This is the original name of this um, place. And the name, the two names, Judea and Samaria, are coming from two distinct 
Jewish kingdoms that ruled in this area, the kingdom of Israel, um, her capital, the capital of the kingdom was the city of Samaria, and uh, the kingdom, kingdom of Judah, uh, hence Jews, hence Judaism, the reason that we're called Jews, um, some of us. Um, so that's the, the name, that's the, um, if you want, the indigenous name of the area, Judea and Samaria, um, for the two Jewish kingdoms that stood there. The West Bank is, by all terms, a colonial name given by Jordan to this area after it came to control it in 1948. It was given just to separate um, the East Bank of the Jordan River, which uh, Jordan River is now the, the international border between Jordan and Israel, so mainland Jordan would be the East River, uh, the East Bank of the River, and they wanted to differentiate that from the West Bank of the River, which is Judea and Samaria. Um, and obviously they were not keen on using Jewish indigenous terms, so they named it the West Bank. Um, this is now the common um, name that people use for that. Uh, the reason I really don't like it, first of all, because it was given by an illegal occupier of the land, uh, Jordan. Only three countries in the world recognize Jordan as sovereign in these territories. One of them is Jordan, the other, the other one is Britain, um, who obviously had an interest in that. Um, and the second uh, reason, it might be a little petty, but I never met, uh, I never saw a bank that is wider than the actual river. Um, so that name is really weird. Um, and the third name that is most commonly used by anti-Israel activists is the occupied territories. Um, the term is legally inaccurate. According to international law, in order to occupy a territory, the territory has to be um, a sovereign state's territory before the time of occupation. Um, as I said before, only three countries in the world recognize Jordan's sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, which means Israel could not have occupied it. It was not a sovereign territory of any other country. Um, and, and, and this term is basically just a term that is trying to delegitimize Jewish presence and sovereignty over this territory. Um, so who lives there? Um, so there are two and a half million Palestinians um, who are governed by the Palestinian Authority, uh, which is a body um, headed by Mahmoud Abbas, he's um, the president of the Palestinian Authority. Um, power sharing partners would be um, his party, Fatah, and Hamas, uh, which is recognized as a terror organization by both Israel, um, the United States, and many other countries, but they are a power sharing partner um, in this government that controls two and a half million Palestinians who uh, live there. In theory, um, the Palestinians who are living there are supposed to be able to elect their leaders. Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is currently, if I'm not mistaken, on the 15th or 16th uh, year of his four years term. Um, so that's very unfortunate. And these people, I am not going to, you know, try and cover it. They are not living um, as they should be. They do not have sufficient political uh, rights and freedoms. In addition to the two and a half million Palestinians who are living there, there are 770,000 Israelis that are governed by Israel through the IDF. Um, the IDF is the Israeli Defense Forces, um, and they govern the Israelis who live there. They are, they are Israeli citizens, um, but for example, for a law that is passed in the Israeli parliament to apply to these territories to these individuals, the, the Israelis who live there, um, the IDF has to uh, issue a special proclamation applying this law to the residents, uh, the Israeli residents of Judea and Samaria. Um, 92,000 of the Palestinians who uh, live in these areas work daily in Israel, um, both in the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, but that's a very minor number. The most of them are working um, in, in other parts of Israel um, and go daily between Judea and Samaria and other parts of Israel. Um, so obviously you tuned into this lecture to hear about 
the settlers, um, perhaps the most vilified group uh, in the international scene. Um, and when you think of the settlers, you're probably thinking about these four guys at the top of the picture here, you know, um, long sideburns, uh, tzitzit, uh, crazy throwing rocks, um, probably some of you would recognize it, Amar ben um, with the tie, he's a prominent lawyer. Um, and a very right-wing politician, uh, extreme right-wing. Um, but in reality, these are not um, most of the settlers. Um, so in Judea and Samaria, you have four cities, six regional councils, and 14 local councils, um, and overall more than 150 communities. It's true most of them are relatively small in American terms, uh, but not very small in Israeli terms. Um, the people living there might surprise you. Third of them are secular, third of them are religious, uh, national religious, and, and third of them are ultra-Orthodox, when the ultra-Orthodox are mainly in two main cities. Um, and one big community in Judea and Samaria. Um, and all these people really have different motives to live there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you got that already. I belong to the first group, the third secular. Um, and you might think that all the secular people, you know, like each group corresponds to a different motive and the secular would be economic and religious ideal ideological and the orthodox would come from religious reasons, but that's not actually the case. Um, my family moved to Male Shomron, it's a small community in the Samaria, um, in the height of the Gulf War, um, because they, you know, they felt that they are needed there. They felt that uh, building a house, building a home in, in the Samaria is not just, um, a good investment. It wasn't back then because there was literally nothing there. Um, they felt like they are needed. This is their life mission. Um, they felt that the cradle of Jewish civilization is being neglected and there is a dire need of more Israelis to live there. Uh, people who believe in the right of the Jewish people uh, to live in their ancestral homeland. Uh, and that's the reason my parents moved there. That's the reason they still live there. And that's the reason I, in my future, plan to raise my, my family. Um, in Judea and Samaria, I don't know where yet. Um, probably not the same community as my parents, but um, but yeah. Um, but other than that, there are people who are coming from religious reasons. Um, I'm I'm sure you all understand that um, a lot of people say, you know, uh, God gave us this land, and that's the reason we go there. Um, obviously, there are a lot of security reasons, um, as you saw in earlier slides. It's a huge, huge portion of Israel. Um, it has a very high mountain range um, that um, practically controls the entire Israel. And if um, and that's the argument that a lot of people are making, that if um, Hamas, for example, would take over that territory, it would be very easy for them uh, to target with missiles Israeli civilians and infrastructure in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or um, any other place. So that's also a reason, but that's not a main reason people move there. People don't like being human shields. Um, they go there because they believe in the ideology, because they believe in, in, in Judaism and in the promise that God gave them that land. Um, and many of them uh, specifically in recent years, are coming from economic reasons. Um, since the demand for houses in Judea and Samaria was pretty low until recently, uh, people could build and buy homes, um, larger homes that they would be able to buy in other places in Israel. Um, most, not most, but a lot of the communities are right on the green line. So it means it's like 30 minutes drive, 40 minutes drive from Tel Aviv or from Jerusalem. So it's exactly like living in the suburbs, but way cheaper. Um, and honestly, a great place to raise families and kids, uh, very quiet most of the time. Um, although it may uh, sound a little funny now that I think of it, um, but it's a great place to raise kids. And I, I am happy I was. Um, now I just want to move to my story. I, um, probably older than most of you, was born in 1994. So when the Second Intifada, um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's, um, 
the Palestinian uprising, that's uh, the picture that you see. It's an episode in Israel history where um, Palestinians, residents of Judea and Samaria, decided to revolt against um, Israeli sovereignty in the area, but not just in the area. Um, so suicide bombers would um, blow themselves up in Tel Aviv or in Kfal Saba or uh, in famously in, Malo in, in Park Hotel in, in Netanya, uh, killing um, over the course of the Second Intifada, thousands of people. And when all of this started, I was six years old. Um, I, I would just say, I mean, you probably only know the word Intifada, most of you, uh, from the chants that you hear from Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace, um, that they chant, long live the Intifada. So when they chant long live, live the Intifada, they are chanting long live the murder of Jewish civilians um, as a political tool. Um, so just keep that in mind. And when this all started, I was six years old. I did not know any of these things. And to me, um, I mean, it, it's funny, but, but it, seems, it seemed quite normal. I grew up in an environment um, you know, when you're six, I was going to school in a bus. We, my community is relatively small. We don't have a school in my community, so we would commute to a different community. Um, and every day on the bus, we we had we had a drill, and we had to put our head uh, hands on our head and um, hide uh, underneath the chairs. So if someone shoots at us or throw Molotov cocktails at the windows, um, the glass from the window would not break and um, hurt us. Um, at some point, the buses became bulletproof, but we still had that um, drill. And to me, as a six-year-old, that's the first year I went to school. It seemed quite normal. I, I thought that everyone does that when they go to school. Um, now I know it wasn't normal. Um, I even remember one case where coming back from school the same year in 2000, um, two Palestinians ran towards our bus, our school bus, uh, with torches in their hands, um, forcing the bus to stop. It was a very sharp turn, so they stood there with the torches about to light the bus on fire um, uh, and forced us to stop. And, and um, luckily, our bus driver had a pistol. He went outside, shot two shots to the air um, and scared them away. Um, and then we continued on our, on our way home. Um, but it's not normal. No child should live like that. Um, and, and when I tell that story, many people ask me why. Why did we choose to stay there um, after all of that? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, the reason is, first of all, as I told you, um, I'm not there because it's convenient. I'm there because I believe that the Jewish people came back after 2000 years in exile, after discrimination and persecution and genocide. And they came back to the land of Israel uh, with all due respect, not for the Azraeli towers in Tel Aviv and not for the Sarona garden um, next to it and not to eat in nice cafes on the beach. Uh, they came back for Hebron and for Shechem and for Jerusalem, obviously. Um, and I don't feel that I, in the year 2020 have any right to give up these things that my ancestors fought so hard to gain back um, and i don't want to um, this is a part of who i am and um, if someone wants to kick me out of there um, i mean i'm not gonna let them and but being say that i mean that's all nice but in the end of the day i've been living there um i'm now 26 next week but um but until then you know i lived in israel until i moved here for colombia um less than three years ago and during the second intifada was the only time that i felt unsafe um i i know that you hear in the news that it's uh warfare going on every single day um that's not true okay this is something that is very important to to note that's not the reality on the ground. I have lived there um, for 23 years in a row before I moved here to New York. Um, 
I have never um, encountered any violence. Nobody throw Molotov cocktails on me, no rocks, besides obviously for the second intifada, which lasted um, only a few years. Obviously it's not, I'm, I'm not legitimizing it in any way, but, but most of the time it's not what you hear in the news. Um, in the news, they have two minute segments and they have to talk about, you know, that thing that happened right now and it sounds very, very horrible. But most of the time, um, you know, people are working there, people are living there, people have businesses and families. Um, and they are there because they believe they want to be there or because they want to raise their kids there or because they believe that God gave it to them or I don't know, like each person has their own reasons. but. Most of the time, it's not what you hear in the news. So when you do, just remember that um, they give you a very narrow frame of what happened right here, right now, and they don't necessarily give you the full picture. Uh, they would obviously not tell you why, for example, settlers were there. They would just tell you it's their fault because they're there, but they were never gonna tell you why people choose to leave there. Um, and this is why, um, although this is quite controversial, and um, if you ask Elon, uh, the president of SSI Nationals, he will tell you that I tell him almost on the weekly basis that we have to be less political. Um, but I think it is important to know. Um, and then I move to our role as student leaders, as students, it's just people interacting with other people. You can disagree with me on everything, okay? You can think, you know what? Okay, I get it. Um, Jews live there. 4,000 years ago, the, the, the two temples were there, uh, all the, you know, mothers and fathers of Judaism were buried there, but for peace, we need to give it all up. You might be true. I might disagree. I might agree with you. You can agree with my perspective, but you should know it. You should know the facts. You should know that it's not just a bunch of crazy people who decided to, you know, occupy and heal just for the sake of, you know, just being there. Um, there is a reason why these people are there. And even if you think that today we need to make compromises for peace or for any other objective, you should know that we have a right to be there. We, maybe we should give it up. Maybe our right, you know, we should give up our right and say, you know what, let us be the bigger people and, you know, give up our, our rights for peace. But you should know that we have them. Um, this, I think, was the most important point for me um, to, to bring across. Um, and then I just want to end um, before I go to Q&A, which is, I think is way more important than my entire presentation. Um, I want to talk about what's next. Um, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, so some people talk about peace, some people talk about annexation, some people talk about just maintaining the status quo forever. Um, the honest answer is, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that it has to happen by people. It has to, to, to be fulfilled by people who understand the history, who know the complexity of this area. Um, and, and these people might be people that we go to school with. They're, they might be people in our communities. Um, I don't know, I mean, Obama went to Columbia College. So I don't know, maybe the next Obama is on this, on this call. And if you are here, um, I'm really glad maybe you'll remember that in the future. Um, but we should talk from a place of knowledge and not from a place of just titles that we see on Fox News or CNN or just like, you know, a news flash that we see um, now and then. And now I just want to uh, move into q and I think that's the most important thing. So I'm going to stop the share. Um, so the first part of the Q&A is going to be uh, recorded. So if you don't want to be, if, if you don't mind asking the question on record, go ahead. And if you do mind, um, when I see people are not asking any more questions, I'm going to ask Elon to stop the recording and we can do a few questions without um, Q&A. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. If you want, there's like a raise hand bottom in the participants, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Um, I have a question. So 
how how do you um interpret um the word Jew? Like I'm not sure if I should consider it like through ethnicity or um religion. I wonder how how do you guys use the word Jew? Okay, that's a very, very important question, and I probably should have talked about it in my presentation before I started. Um, I know that in the US today, um, and in many Western countries, um, Jews are perceived as a religion. Um, I tend to think that the reason for that is because it is compared to Christianity and Islam, which are religions. Um, they're main goal is not i don't know if the main but one of their goals is to convert other people to their religion and gain as many followers as they can this is not the case with judaism and this is why the equivalence between judaism and christianity and islam i think is fundamentally wrong um judaism started before religion was even a recognized concept on the world stage uh, you know more than four thousand years ago um and the the characteristics of judaism are very different than um than other religions that you might think of so uh for example um someone who is jewish is not just someone who converts for the, the basic uh pre-requirement if you want to call it to being jewish is being born to a jewish mom uh, which means that it's an ethnic thing. You have to be born into the tribe in order um, to to belong to the Jewish people. And in my view of Judaism, Judaism is more than anything a people. It's a nation of people um, who have a common, who have a few common characteristics. One of them is religion, no doubt, uh, but there are other characteristics as well. I mean, uh, current values uh, and common values, uh, common language, uh, which is not something that other religions have. For example, um, Christians can speak multiple languages. Um, Muslims can, you know, there's Muslims who speak Arabic, uh, some of them speak uh, French, some of them in uh, Indonesia, for example, um, or other countries in Asia speak other languages. Um, so, so for me, when I think of Judaism, I first and foremost think of a nation of people. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, so I have two questions in the chat. I'm just gonna uh, quickly address them. Do Jewish residents have access to all parts of Judea and Samaria? So no, um, the answer is no. Um, the thing is this, um, a court, so this might be <laughs> a little political. Um, Israel and the Palestinian Authority um, signed an agreement uh, called the Oslo Accords, um, and 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 in under this accord, the entire territory of Judea and Samaria is divided into three areas: A, B, and C. In area A, uh, is completely under the control of the Palestinian Authority. Um, the, the Palestinian Authority police and security forces control it, um, and to that area, Jews are not permitted to enter. If you drive through Judea and Samaria, you would see um, huge red signs saying Israelis are not allowed. Area Bs are mainly roads um, and agricultural lands, which um, are under the PA, the Palestinian Authority civil control and um, Israel's uh, military control. And area Cs are exactly like A, but the other way around, um, full Israeli sovereignty and control. Um, so thank you for that question. The second question, do Palestinian Arab get permits to build in the West Bank? So yes, um, they mostly build in area A, um, which according to Oslo Accords that they signed on, their leadership signed on, these are the areas that are designated to be the future Palestinian state if, if, a, if a settlement is reached. Um, they also build in area B. Um, there is construction going on, Palestinian construction in area C. Um, I would not call it getting permits, um, but there is building going on. I'm not going to get too political, um, but it's unpermitted building in Area C that is supposed to be um, under Israeli control. Um, and the la okay, last question. Okay, a few questions in the chat. Uh, what is the difference between areas A, B, and C? Okay, I answered that. Um, if you can address what was the Hebron agreement and what is the status of the city of Hebron? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> You're really like pushing me off the cliff. Okay, great. I was trying to be non-political. Um, Hebron, uh, Hebron is perhaps the most complicated city in Judea and Samaria. Um, 
some would even claim more than Jerusalem. Um, so the Israel and the Palestinians reached the Havon Agreement. Um, Similarly to uh, the similar to the Oslo Agreement, the Oslo Accords who divide um, Judea and Samaria to A, B, and C, um, the Hebron Agreement divides the city of Hebron into areas H1, H2. Um, the city of Hebron is a complicated city. Um, it was originally a Jewish city, the tomb of the Patriarch, um, where um, the mothers and fathers of Judaism are buried, um, is there. Um, and um, until 1929, um, there was a, a sizable Jewish community living there among, you know, the Palestinian Arab population. In 1929, um, the Arabs who live in Hebron um, massacred the entire Jewish population and made it flee. Today, there is a very, very small Jewish population living there. And according to the Hebron Agreement, they're only allowed to reside and access a few streets inside the city. And nine, more than 90% of the city is um, accessible only to Palestinians. Um, before I address the other question in the chat. I saw that Sami, you had a question. So if you want to ask it. Sami? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy to see you. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, I know the situation in uh, Columbia University. So I'm just going to ask you uh, how does uh, SSI, as an organization, uh, dealing with the anti-Semitism? Because I understand that the administration is not very helpful to you. Okay, thank you, Sammy, for your question. Um, I'm gonna shortly address it, um, although it, it's a bit off topic, but I think it's a really important question. Um, so if you just go to our Facebook page, Students Supporting Israel at Columbia University, you see that even today we posted um, a condemnation of a post that was made by one of the tenured professors at Columbia um, saying horrible, I'm not even going to repeat them, things about Israel. Uh, this is a professor who is uh, bluntly anti-Semitic. It's not the first time and it's not the only professor who is anti-Semitic at Columbia. Um, in the past, I, we as a group felt that the administration is not doing enough. I can still tell you I personally don't think the administration is doing enough, but I think they're doing more than they did in the past. Uh, I would just give an example. So um, I think it really demonstrates how they're not doing enough and starting to do more uh, at the same instance. They invited the prime minister of Malaysia, um, Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, uh, who's a vile anti-Semite. I mean, he, he's, he calls himself an anti-Semite. It's not something that I say about him. It's something he said about himself. They hosted him at Columbia in the Global Leaders Forum. This shows that they're not doing enough. This shows that they don't understand they have an anti-Semitism problem. But when Students Supporting Israel reached out to the administration and cooperated with two other Jewish groups, um, and we emailed President Bollinger, the president of Colombia, to talk to him about it, um, he replied in a matter of two days and made sure that um, the prime minister is condemned in front of him on stage, being called out for being an anti-Semite. So I think Colombia is doing uh, more. I don't think it's doing enough. Um, and SSI, you know, we will continue to educate people as much as we can um, and put all our powers um, into it because we really believe that's the only way to go about it. And obviously um, keep being on the offense and not on the defense. So when we see professors saying- Here, here a follow-up question. Yeah. Do the Jewish students feel safe at Columbia? I, I can't speak for all the Jewish students. I assume some of them do and some of them don't. Um, um, but we are doing our best to make sure that as many Jewish students and pro-Israel students are feeling safe on campus. Okay. I'm quick, yeah. Thank you, Sammy. I'm quickly going to move to another question that I got in the chat. How are the Palestinian Arabs handling coronavirus? Are there any cooperation be between Jews and Arabs in Israel regarding the issue at all? So um, currently, the number of confirmed cases um, 
in the Palestinian Authority and in Gaza are pretty low, um, but it is a very serious concern. Um, Israel and the Palestinians are working together um, to try and handle the situation in the best way possible. We understand um, that, you know, Corona in Israel could, you know, quickly spread into Palestinian cities and vice versa. Um, and Israel and the Palestinian Authority are working together in several avenues. First of all, um, in terms of Israel um, supplying some medical assistance and medical um, equipment to the Palestinians, but also um, in terms of security. I mean, um, Israel is now restricting the number of uh, Palestinian workers who are allowed to come to work in Israel. Um, because they understand that Israel has, you know, more Corona confirmed cases. So if one of these workers catches Corona in, in, in Tel Aviv, for example, and goes back to Nablus, um, he can easily infect a lot of people. Um, and that requires a lot of security coordination between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, something that exists on a daily basis, but now it's even um, heightened more. Um, any other question? Okay, um, Elon, can you stop the recording, please?